Well, it's a blessing to be with you tonight, to be able to study the Word of God and to look into the Scriptures, and we know and are confident that we'll be encouraged by the reading of God's Word and consideration of those uh, very spiritual and eternal principles and truths. Thank you so much for being here. As has already been mentioned, if you are visiting with this congregation, I know that uh, you are considered an honored guest, and they are delighted that you are here, and that's an encouragement not only to them and to myself, uh, but it is pleasing to the Lord when we gather together to reason together and to consider His divine Word. It has been a very, very encouraging blessing to me to have been with this congregation this week, and I would feel entirely negligent and remiss if I did not take just a brief opportunity to thank each and every member of this church that has been so faithful in your attendance and has been so encouraging not only to one another but to me and uh, you have refreshed me in my faith and you have encouraged me and I appreciate that so much and I hope that the things that we've been able to talk about and study from the Word of God are principles and truths and I'm confident that they are that will encourage all of us to serve the Lord and to live a life that glorifies Him and would lead us to be right with Him in eternity. Of course, it has been a blessing to be with Jesse and April and uh, all of their children and family. It has really been good. By the way, there is some really good breakfast over there at the Flowers House, I'll tell you. And uh, it has been such a joy to be able just to visit and uh, to be able to talk about spiritual things and to see their faith, and that's been an encouragement to me. And I know you appreciate both of them. And I know you appreciate that family because so many of you have mentioned that to me. And they love you as well as you work together. And I also appreciate Brother Jesse for his uh, firm faith and for the stand for truth that he has always taken. For his encouragement of others. For him preaching the truth with conviction, without compromise, and in love. And he is a good Bible student. He is conscientious in his work. And I'm sure you know all of those things. But I appreciate the work you all are doing together. Thank everyone for your hospitality. I know it's not always easy to feed me. It can be a challenge, uh, but uh, you all have done so well, and we've been able to spend that time together. And there is something special about Christians just being able to talk about God's Word together in a private way, in a personal way, but also when we gather together to assemble uh, and discuss the Word of God. So thank everyone for all the encouragement and all the good things that you're doing, and I just want to invite and encourage you to continue doing what you're doing, and sharing and spreading the gospel of Christ with uh, those you come in contact with. That's really what our work and our mission is, and appreciate you so much in that regard. Well, the story is uh, told of a man that approached a Little League baseball game one afternoon, and he asked a boy in the dugout, he said, uh, what, what's the score? And the little boy with confidence said, well, we're losing he said, how bad? He said, it's 18 to nothing. He said, we're behind. And the spectator said, boy, I'll bet you're discouraged. It's just the first inning. And uh, the little boy said, why would I be discouraged? We still have to get up to bat. <laughs> and sometimes that's kind of our view of hope. G.K. Chesterton wrote about hope. He said, it's, it seems that only... When everything is hopeless, that hope begins to be a strength. But what is hope? We use that word in some different ways. Is it like the optimistic uh, little boy that thought, oh, eight, 18 is nothing. Well, we can get 18 runs in one inning. Is there more to hope than that? What does the Bible mean when it talks about hope? Different people have different ideas. I think sometimes when we talk about hope, we might use it in this particular way. I hope this works out. And it may be more along the line of wishful thinking. You know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful in that I have wishful thinking. I don't know if it's going to work out or not, but I hope. I've even heard some criticize Christians talking about that they have Hope of heaven. I don't know why you would do that. The Bible talks about the hope of heaven. But I think the problem is they don't understand biblical hope. They almost are equating it to just this idea of wishful thinking. I, I, I hope in that sense. But I want to submit to you 
tonight. That the manner in which the Bible is presenting our hope of salvation is much more than the idea of wishful thinking. And we are to live in hope. And it's a hope that offers us assurance. So we're going to think about hope. How does it impact our life? First of all, what is it? How can we increase the hope that we have by God's grace? What is involved in hope? When we think about growing in hope, is that even a possibility? As I mentioned already, it's, it's much more than a positive outlook, even though we all want to have a positive outlook. Rather, it is a confident expectation of God's faithfulness toward his people. In fact, Paul would write, there are three things that abide in that particular context. You'll remember that. He mentions faith, hope, and love. And he says the greatest of these is love. Now, that's interesting when you think about faith and hope and love because love is something that will last all through eternity. You know, when you think about faith, the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. We read that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so faith is not just this idea of a blind leap or something like that or just, you know, pie in the sky or something along that line. No, it's much more than that. Faith is reasonable, it transcends human reason, but it involves reasoning as we look at the scriptures and the word of God. When we think of hope, likewise, there's actually a biblical definition of hope. And so that's where we're going to begin tonight as we think about this idea of hope. In fact, the psalmist would write in Psalms 42 and verse 11, Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. That's Psalms 42, 11. Now there are other passages very similar to that that mention trusting in God. And so in the Old Testament, often it'll talk about trusting in the Lord and not yourself. Here he says, though, in Psalms 42, 11, hope in God, the Apostle Peter, and we'll look at this more in a moment, but 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, you might notice the way he describes our hope there. He says it's grounded and based on the resurrection of Jesus. I can have hope for reasons. There are reasons for my hope as a Christian. So it's not just, well, my family's always believed this. My mom and dad had hope. My grandparents had hope. Everybody I worship with seems to have hope. No, there, there is a very personal sense of an individual sense of us believing and trusting God because we know Jesus was raised from the dead. You might also remember other passages as we think about trying to define hope. Here's, here's a definition that I think is very helpful. It is that hope is the confident expectation that God's promises will certainly be fulfilled because of his faithful loyalty and his steadfast love. I know that's a little wordy, but notice the ideas here. The idea of a confident expectation when it comes to God's promises being fulfilled. And then the idea of faithful loyalty and steadfast love. Often in the Old Testament, there's a Hebrew word. It's the word hesed. If we were using uh, an English word, it sounds like H-E-S-E-D. So that particular word is used a lot in the Old Testament. The word hesed, now it depends on your translation, sometimes it will define it as a steadfast love or loyal love. Often loving kindness is the word that we probably see in a lot of our translations. And that particular word is this idea of a faithful love. You know, we sing that hymn, faithful love. That's very rooted in this idea that we're talking about. God is faithful in his love toward us to fulfill his promises. And an awareness, a belief, a conviction, an assurance of that leads me to have hope. And so there is a reasonable hope. There is a reasonable hope. So let's really think about this idea of building hope or growing in our hope and what hope really is. So turn to Romans 8. I think there's two passages they're especially helpful in the New Testament. So we're going to try to define from a biblical standpoint what hope is. Because if we're going to grow in hope, we need to know what it is. Romans chapter 8 
And this is in a context, as you know, where Christians are suffering for their faith in Christ. These are not unfaithful Christians. These are very devoted Christians that he's addressing especially. And so in Romans chapter 8, as he's talking about our hope of resurrection, notice something here with me. In Romans 8 and in verse 23, he says that not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Let's pause there just for a minute. You know, that idea of groaning is something we see in several places. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as, he think, as we think about the Christian and his hope of immortality, his hope of a future bodily resurrection, or here in this passage, very similar context, there's this idea of groaning. And so it's not saying that we're not saved. We are saved, and that's part of the reason that we're groaning in this sinful world. So when you look at Romans chapter 8, we, we have this hope, but then we look at the world, the sin-sick world, that the brokenness of the world around us. He says in verse 24, we have, verse 23 says we have this hope. Verse 24, for in hope we have been saved. Let me mention something to you that I think might help here. You know, some verses talk about salvation in the past tense. You've probably noticed that before. This is one of them, that we have been saved. So when you initially become a Christian, there is a sense that once you've obeyed the gospel, you look back and say, I have been saved. And that would, that would be appropriate to say. Ephesians 2 mentions it that way. A lot of passages speak of salvation in that sense. But also there are other passages that speak of a present saving process that's going on. And then there are other passages that speak of our future resurrection, our final glorification, and speak of salvation in the future tense. Now, which one is right? All of them. There's a sense in which in the past we were saved and now we're children of God. There's a sense in which as we, as we grow in the Lord, we, we are so appreciative of what God has done and continues to do for us. Christ is our mediator on the right hand of God. But then there's a sense, 1 Peter 1 talks about this. That as we go through trials, we have that sense of a final salvation at the end. And we have that promise, but we must live faithfully according to that promise. 1 John 2.25 says we've been promised eternal life. And we look forward to that, to being with the Lord in heaven. So when you come back to Romans chapter 8, he says, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Let's kind of work through some of that. You'll notice there in verse 24, he says we have this hope. In fact, he says we're saved by this hope. He goes further and he says, but hope that is seen. And this is going to help us understand it. Hope that is seen, that is all of your hope has been fulfilled. I mean, it's been realized in, in every way. You already have everything you could possibly have. Well, you wouldn't continue to hope for something like that. There's a, when you think about hope, there's a sense of a future anticipation. So let me go ahead and show my cards here <laughs> and tell you what I think the biblical definition of hope is, and perhaps you've heard this before. And that is really, as you look at the Bible, hope can be defined as desire plus expectation. So we may desire a thing, but we don't expect to receive it. That's not biblical hope. Or we might expect, let me tell you as a kid, there, there were a lot of times I was expecting a whipping from my, <laughs> from, from my parents, but it wasn't something I was desiring. I wasn't going, boy, I'm hoping for that because I anticipate that it's going to happen. So when you, you go back and think about this, it's desire plus expectation. That's the biblical concept of hope. And I think that's the point Paul is making when he says here, he says, look, we are hoping, and because we hope for it, we haven't received everything. It's been promised to us, hasn't it? But we're living in this life. We have been saved, but we continue to journey toward the fulfillment of this. Thus we have hope. Notice again, he says in verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not see, 
with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Now, by the way, in the Scripture, in the Word of God, when you look at the concept of waiting, you know, when we talk about waiting, you think about going to the doctor's office. It's not a very pleasant experience. <laughs> I had to wait three hours for something. And we're sitting there thinking, are they ever going to get me in? In the Bible, the idea of waiting on the Lord, which we see from time to time, Psalms 27 talks about that. The idea of waiting, while I suppose there is a, a sense in which you're holding back, but waiting is an active thing we do. It's active in the sense that as we are waiting for the final fulfillment of God's promises, that leads us to persevere. So it's not just, well, we're just, you know, we're going to kind of stand back and, and, and watch everything unfold. No, it's more active than that. It's motivated out of faith. So hope, notice what he says. He says, if we hope for what we do not see, we know it, it can come. We know it's available in promise. But he says, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. So when I have this hope, it leads me to persevere faithfully in the sight of God. When my mind is focused on Jesus and I face temptation or I face trial, you see, those things pale in comparison to my hope. Now what Satan wants us to do is take our, our eyes off of Jesus. He wants us not to think about the hope. He wants us to think about the right here and now and nothing else. And when we do that, that's when we make bad decisions. That's when we rebel against the sight of God. So we have that idea. Come to Philippians 1. Let's look at Philippians 1. And, and you see desire and expectation there in Philippians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. Philippians 1. You'll notice Paul there as he's talking about the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Verse 20. He says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose for I'm hard pressed from both directions. Having notice, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. But he says, if I live on in the flesh, I'm going to bear fruit with you. I'm going to work with you. But think about what he says. He says, I have this desire. If you ask me what I want, if you ask me what would absolutely be in my best interest, it would be to go on and be with Christ. It would be to die because to die is gain. So he's, he's talking about hope in a very broad, general sense here. But we have desire. Then look at verse 20. We have expectation. And then when you look at Romans 8, you have expectation. So, so this, this is the point that I, I want you to think about. And that is that our hope is sure and steadfast because God is sure and steadfast. When we talk about or the scriptures speak of our hope as being the anchor of the soul. Why is that? Because our hope is rooted and grounded in God. So we can grow in the hope of the gospel or we can move away from it. So wait a minute, I can move away from it? Yes, that's what Colossians chapter 1 says. You might notice that with me. Colossians 1 and in verse 23. Colossians 1 and verse 23, he says, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So he says, and you'll see the connection. Do you see the connection between faith? And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Faith and hope. So you can't have one and not the other. It's not that you can have faith and not have hope, and you sure can't have hope without faith. But he says, stand firmly in the faith and don't be moved away from the gospel. So the key to not being moved away from the gospel is standing firmly in the faith. And we've already said, where does faith come from? I mean, what really is the means God uses to give us faith? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so the more we're in the Word, the stronger our faith is and the stronger our hope is. 
When we get away from God's Word, when we get away from the Scriptures, we're going away from the means of God giving us this living hope. Hebrews chapter 6. We couldn't talk about hope without looking at that. You might turn over there with me and recall this. Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6 in verse 17, you might notice with me. He says, in the same way God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness, some translations say immutability of his purpose interposed with an oath. That by two unchangeable or immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. God's not going to lie. It would violate his nature. We who have taken refuge, those who are running away from the world to God, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. Now think about that. So hope is something we're involved in grasping onto. So we're not completely passive in this. He goes on to say in verse 19, this hope, which we've already said is desire and expectation, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. You think about an anchor in a boat. Have you ever been out there fishing? You thought, man, I wish we had an anchor right now because we're floating all over the place. And at first you might not realize and you look up and you're a long way from where you began. He says this, this hope anchors us in the storms of life. God anchors us through this hope. So we can grow in this hope, no doubt about it. Now, is it reasonable to have this hope? You know, some people out there are saying, look, God doesn't exist and, and Christ wasn't raised and this is just a fairy tale you all believe in. Just briefly, I would say to you that it's important that we recognize that the most reasonable conclusion, and if I didn't believe this, I wouldn't be a Christian. The most reasonable conclusion is the existence of God. You know, it's interesting, so many people who question the existence of God hesitate to have this particular conversation because at some point they hit a brick wall and it's very uncomfortable. And that is, I'm supposed to believe that as complex as things are, which is often called an argument called the irreducible complexity of life. And the more we learn, the more this discovers scientifically and medically, it's not that things have gotten less complex. We've learned that things are more complex than we could ever imagine. And brethren, I don't think that's going to slow down anytime soon. The more we learn, you think about DNA and RNA and protein, and it would be complicated enough if you isolate those things, but the fact that there's an interdependence, and if that interdependence is not functioning, we know there are significant problems that take place. And then I'm supposed to believe that happened randomly and by some haphazard accident, and it's just amazing that it happened, but it, but it just happened? Or should I think of the notion of there being a designer? And then we start to talk about moral issues. And the skeptic talks about morality, but he doesn't mean what the believer in God means. What he really means is whatever any given society has decided is good or bad, but really there is no good or bad. And men like Richard Dawkins have said, we're just, you know, beings to propagate DNA. There's no good or evil. Any time a Calvinist, not a Calvinist, an atheist, I'm going to the Calvinist in a minute, hang on. Any time an atheist begins to talk about the idea of how unreasonable it is to believe in God, I would ask him where did he get the idea of reason in the first place. Reason has to be outside of us. Any time a skeptic says to me, well, Bruce, I think it, your idea of God is unjust or wicked, and I've heard all of these things, evil, sinful. Where did you get any of those ideas? There's a great book. He's uh, not a New Testament Christian, but he's a defender of the existence of God by a man by the name of Frank Jurek. And Frank Jurek wrote a book called Stealing from God. <laughs> and here's how the argument goes. And that is that... Atheists have to plagiarize 
concepts that only a believer in God can have, such as objective truth, objective right and wrong. Even the idea of love demands objective truth. They have to plagiarize all of that to make, now think about this, this will make your brain hurt, I know, but it makes mine hurt. But they have to plagiarize those concepts that really only a, a, a believer could hold on to who believes in God and thus he defines morality. They take those concepts and try to use it against the existence of God. They have no right to those concepts. If there is no God, there is no good or evil. There's survival of the fittest, maybe. There's no designer. How do we talk about morality? And this is part of what's wrong, in large part of what's wrong, in our own society and culture. You know, we're talking about, by good, what often people mean is what I want. The believer in God is saying, no, good is defined by the Lord. I had a young lady call me one time that was taking a philosophy class at the University of Central Arkansas there in Conway, and she had to take an intercession. And her, one of the questions was regarding the existence of God, and did God create morality? And of course, the right answer is no. God is the definition of morality. Morality is rooted in the attributes of God. There was not a time where morality wasn't and then it was because there was not a time when God wasn't and then he was. See, that's, a, that's kind of a trick question skeptical philosophers will try to give to you. But, but that's not the case at all. So, they'll say, so let's say you say, well, I think God created morality. And they'll say to you, well, then your God's not moral because there was a time before he created morality and there was a time when there was no morality and see, that's just a trick question. The truth is, morality is de defined by God. Now, how does that relate to what we're talking about? The notion of truth is where faith comes from. The concept of desire and expectation comes back to the foundation of faith. You can go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. So all of this is defined by the faithfulness of God and the hope we have of the resurrection. As you're looking at Hebrews 11.1, 1, just think about this. this. This hope is reasonable because it's grounded in something that objectively happened. And by the way, Christianity is the only religion that claims that its founder was actually raised from the dead and can demonstrate that that's the logical conclusion. Romans 1.4, before we get to Hebrews, Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 says to us that Jesus' divinity was confirmed through the resurrection. The reason we have hope is because of his sacrifice. But not only did he sacrifice himself, he was raised from the dead. Our conversion is declared. You think about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's why we have hope of eternal life. And thus Peter would call this a living hope. And in 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul was addressing those, who are denying a future resurrection of humanity, where does he begin? He goes back to the resurrection of Jesus. We've all seen that. He talks about the scriptures and the eyewitness testimony and all of this, but his whole point is to come back and say, listen, Jesus is the first fruits. We're going to be the harvest. The reason we believe what we do about the final resurrection, which is a major component in our hope, is because we believe Jesus was raised from the dead. He says, if you believe Jesus was raised from the dead, that means you believe in resurrection. Why are you denying the resurrection at the end? And so everything we see in Scripture is reasonable. Belief in God, morality, truth, the revelation. All of those appeal to, okay, is this, what's the most logical conclusion? Beginning with the very notion of God as creator, coming to God as father, coming to Christ as savior, and, and, and the one who was resurrected, and now who is at the right hand of God, and that leads me to Hebrews 11 and verse 1. In Hebrews chapter 11, you'll notice in verse 1, he says, Now faith 
is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. All right, let's think about that for a minute. If you have a, uh, a King James Version, New King James, any New King James folks in here? Jesse, does it say uh, substance, Jesse? Yes, substance, which is a good translation, really good translation. I, I'm, and I use the New American Standard Bible, and there's a reason they render as assurance. Both of those are good translations on this verse, but here's what I want to point out to you. Is, is the word substance there, if you look at that original word and you think of substance, we think, you know, sub, you think of something um, underneath. Uh, we might even think of a submarine, you know, we, we, something underneath. So when he talks about substance, so you have substance, foundation. So think about the idea of an underlying foundation. So you're going to build a house. You have to have that a good underlying foundation. What if your foundation to your house stinks? <laughs> okay. It's not going to be good, is it? So underlying, underlying foundation. It seems to me what he's saying is faith, which we know comes from God's word, is the underlying foundation on which hope, which is desire and expectation, is built. So the stronger our faith, the stronger our hope. Our hope crumbles when our faith crumbles. So if you look at Hebrews 11.1, 1, now of course this, this is a, a powerful chapter and he talks about these folks and, and, and how they trusted God, men and women, great men and women of faith. Notice verse 6, and without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who what? Seek him. Why do we seek him? Because we believe in him. That's his point. And now we have a foundation of our hope. Now how did that impact these folks? Look at verse 15. And indeed if they had been thinking, well, let's go back up to 14. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. There's some desire and expectation there. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And you could go on and read more in your own personal time from that particular passage. Come to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Now, this is in a context talking about suffering. But let's, let's notice what he says. He talks about hope. So in 1 Peter 3, now usually we, we bring this passage up when we're talking about sharing the gospel and evangelistic efforts. And, and, and that's good. That's fine. But it's interesting, even in the most difficult suffering, that, that may well be our best opportunity to share Christ with somebody. Even those who hate us. Even those who don't have a love for the Lord in the moment. Notice 1 Peter 3, verse 15. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready or prepared or equipped to make a defense. That word defense, I think that King James says to give an answer, and that's a good rendering too. The idea apologia there is uh, offering a defense. We use apology a little different than folks used to. You know, if you read some kind of ancient religious literature, you'll see those who offered an apology. Uh, maybe you go into a, a religious bookstore and you'll probably see an apologetic section. And usually that's, you know, defending things. Now, when we say apology, and Rachel pulled this out on me the other day, we we were discussing something, I'll say. We were discussing something and I had some different views about it. And, um, I, and I just preached on the idea of offering an apology as a defense. And I said, well, I apologize. She said, which way are you apologizing? Because it feels like it's a defense. <laughs> so we're not talking about telling somebody I'm sorry. That's one way we use it. But an apology is to offer a, a reasoned defense. So think about what he's saying. That's the idea here in verse 15. He says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts 
being always ready to make a defense or to offer an answer to everyone who asks you to give an account for what? The hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And I like how the King James renders that. It says to give an answer regarding the reason of the hope. What's the reason of the hope? Well, there should be a reason of the hope. It's a reasonable hope because faith is coming from God's word. It's coming from, from, from reasonable notions regarding God existing, the creation, the resurrection of Jesus, Christ dying on the cross, Jesus being a historical person. All those things feed into that hope. And he says, if you'll notice chapter 3 in verse 15, that we do that with reverence for Christ. We do that with respect for God. When he talks about sanctifying the Lord in your hearts, I first of all reverence Christ more than any man. Think about this. We can't share the hope of Christ with other people until we first have it. And the only way to truly have it is to reverence Christ. You know, it's interesting, some folks that want to have a very casual attitude toward God. I don't mean close relationship with God. I mean casual attitude toward God. And what I mean by casual is they're kind of just, just generally, they're, they're disrespectful about spiritual things. And then they begin to talk about sharing Christ. Listen, look, look at the passage. He says... He mentions the reason of the hope which is in you is to be offered because we've sanctified Christ in our hearts. I'm talking about your life. And then notice going further that that's found in the power and the grace and the mercy and the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus in that context. Look, go, go back to 1 Peter with me. Look at 1 Peter 1, 2. There he talks about that according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled, that means cleansed with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Look at verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold. That's what I'm talking about. From your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And you could go on and you come back to 315. When he says, sanctify the Lord God in your heart, that's what he's talking about. And then in verse 15, he says, we should be calm. Notice 315 again, if you would, with gentleness and reverence, with meekness and with reverence. So how do we ensure that our hope grows? How do we build it through God's power? First of all, the more we know about Scripture, that means the more we know about God. So there's two aspects. First of all, I'm learning about God. Any passage I read, one of the first questions is, what did I learn about God and one of the other questions is, what does that mean for me living for God? If I read texts of Scripture and study it and I don't ask that, then I'm not getting what I need to get at the very beginning. And, and so when you think about the idea of the knowledge of God, yes, we need to learn and grow from the Word of God. All right. But let me mention something else to you. You can know a lot about God and not know God. There's all kinds of people that I mean, do you realize there's so-called biblical scholars out there that don't even believe in God? They're just into ancient literature? That's kind of absurd, I know, but it, it's out there. What I'm saying to you, and, and, Paul, and Paul talks about this a, a lot in Philippians 3 when he talks about knowing Christ. Now, I need to know about Christ, but I need to go further than that. And the word for knowledge in 2 Peter 3.18 that talks about growing in our knowledge. Now that involves Bible study. I want you to understand me very clearly. But it's going to involve more than that. And, and, and what I mean by that is the word knowledge here, the, the original term, is the notion of participating in a relationship with God. Th there is a, a word that we see a lot for knowledge, 
and your baseline is learning more about God, but the notion is growing in relationship with God, that we know Him. And so the more I grow in that, in understanding, in wisdom, in knowledge, the more I'm growing in my hope. Turn to Romans chapter 5, if you'd be so kind to do that. Romans 5, there's something interesting that happens over here in Romans 5 I would like for us to take note of that helps us build our hope as we increase our faith and our hope. Notice it with me. In verse 3, he says, And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Here's what I want you to see. I think this is really important as to, as to the significance of hope. You remember over there in, in Romans 8 where he talks about our hope because of our hope. It leads us. Hope leads us to persevere. Do you remember that over there in Romans chapter 8, verses 23 through 25? So as I grow in my hope, my desire and expectation for the Lord, then that produces, there's a sense in which faith, hope built on faith, produces perseverance. But here's the interesting thing. So as hope produces perseverance, as I continue to persevere, the more I persevere, the more my hope grows. So you have, you have hope fueling perseverance, but you also have perseverance fueling hope. And so they feed off of each other. So we saw that in Romans 8 on one side, but look there in Romans 5 again. He mentions that we exalt even in our tribulation which brings about perseverance, and perseverance brings about proven character, and proven character what? Hope. So you mean when, I, when I'm built, when my faith is growing by God's grace and His Word, then that means my hope is growing, and that hope is going to encourage me in producing perseverance to wait on the Lord, but the more trials I persevere, that are motivated out of the hope that I already have, when I get out on the other side, I have even more hope than I did before I went through it. That's exactly what Paul is saying. So it's really important that we get our minds wrapped around this as we mature in our relationships with God. But you know what? Other people in your life can help you with this hope. In Hebrews chapter 13, Notice with me verse 7. Your godly parents, your godly family, your spiritual family, they all can encourage you in your hope. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and consider the result of their conduct. Imitate their faith. Imitate their faith, their example, their instruction. And when we praise God together, doesn't that enliven our hope when we're singing and praying and, and studying His Word? We've been together tonight. We've been together this week. You all will meet on the first day of the week on Sunday and worship God. When, when we really have the right mindset, isn't it true that singing praises to God and offering prayers to God and looking in His Word and being with fellow believers because we're going to the Word and that's increasing our faith is also increasing our hope. You know, when you see godly men and women who are suffering trials for the Lord and you see them do that with dignity and with courage, doesn't that encourage you? Doesn't that lead you to greater hope, not less hope? Of course, it does. And I'll tell you something else. Growing in obedience to the Lord. Yes, growing in obedience means you're growing in your relationship with God and that that actually, again, is motivated by faith and hope, but also produces faith and hope. And so when we...
deal with difficulties, that may be when we see most vividly the power of our hope in Christ. You remember Habakkuk, when he begins to pray for justice in Habakkuk 1, ends up praying for mercy in Habakkuk 3, and he says, even though Nebuchadnezzar's coming, yet I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. I will, I will joy in him. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Please turn over there with me. What an encouraging text this is. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. What, what really motivated the Apostle Paul when these trials were going on? Well, he says in verse 1, Therefore, since we have this ministry, we have this work, as we've received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we've renounced the, the hidden things because of shame. Come on with me to verse 7. He says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Listen, when we face trials, we don't face it on our own strength. We face trials with His strength. And so our hope grows even from the trial. Verse 8, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Go on with me to verse 16. He says, therefore we don't lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Does that include hope? Well, he's going to go on and tell us that that's actually what's driving this. For momentary, and I want you really to notice, brethren, in verses 17 and 18, uh, the oppositional terms that are used to contrast with each other to emphasize this point of hope. He says, for momentary or temporary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. You say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I, I, we just read about that light affliction, and it didn't look too light to me. But in comparison to the hope, in comparison to the glory, it fades into oblivion. He says in verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. We put so much into right now what we see, what we feel, what we can touch, the, the senses. We live in a very sensual culture. Even in the religious world, a lot has, it's all about being, being tangible and what you see and getting your, your, your senses excited. Listen, that's not really how faith works. That's how the flesh works. Notice with me in verse 18, he says, that's, we're not focusing on the scene because we know those things aren't going to last. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, can we see them only through the eye of faith right now? We will experience them in heaven with the Lord. What gets us through the trial? Well, we know what it produces. We have joy because it produces a stronger faith and a stronger hope, but it's our anticipation of heaven. It's our anticipation of being with the Lord. When we are tempted, we know by faith that God provides the way of escape. Paul, when he talked about his thorn in the flesh, and a, a word for thorn might be stake in the flesh. And he prayed three times. And the answer was, my grace, my grace is sufficient for you. And he says he experienced power in the weakness. Why? Because in the weakness, he could only rely on God. And there was the power. Even hope and tragedy and loss. You think about David losing that child, his child. And all that he had, he had cried out to God. 
And when he cried out that he could not come to me, but I will go to him. Hope. Hope helps us to endure the fiercest, fiercest trials. And then finally, when you look at these passages, what you find as far as the building and the power of our hope is this, and that is that it builds a resilient perseverance. Have you ever known somebody, I'm certain you have, that has just gone through so much, so much loss, or maybe loved ones, or dear friends, or disease, or difficulty, and yet their faith was so intact. I mean, yeah, they went through their difficult times that we talked about on Sunday of disorientation, but their, their faith remained intact, and their hope, and their joy, and their diligence, and you think, they are so resilient. Why? Because their eyes are on the Lord. Whatever happens, we have to keep our eyes on the Lord. And that will further our hope. And that will lead to steadfast assurance. God wants us to recognize the assurance of being his children. And it will bring a comforting peace that is beyond anything we might have ever imagined in this heavenly anticipation, in this joyful zeal, and an enduring resolve. Paul would say this, for I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You've listened very well tonight. I don't know if you've had hope tonight, but you've had perseverance. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your kind consideration of the Word of God. Think about these things. It is our prayer that if tonight you're hearing these things and you know in your mind, I haven't really obeyed the gospel. I believe in Jesus. I want to repent of my sins. I want to confess my faith. I want to be baptized in water for the remission of my sins. I, I, I want to show love for the Lord and walk with Him. And I want to go home tonight and lay my head on my pillow and close my eyes and know that if I don't see another day, I have this hope in Christ. Well, if that's what you're thinking right now, don't leave here. Don't leave here outside of Christ in hopelessness. Come to him and lay hold of the Lamb of God as together we stand.